All right, so in part one, we were uh, looking at Joseph Collins' article in which he advocated in favor of paternalistic deception. Cecilia Bach, in her article, Lying and Lies to the Sick and Dying, on page 141, is going to oppose paternalistic deception. Um, I would point out right at this point that Joseph Collins was an actual practicing physician who has experience in terms of what he's saying. On the other hand, Cecilia Bach is a philosopher, an ethicist, and quite honestly, I've always described her as Immanuel Kant in a dress, um, because her views are very much like his, very rigid, very absolutist. And the fact is that in her article, she is going to oppose the idea of paternalistic deception, saying that under no circumstances whatsoever should we ever lie or deceive a patient. We have an obligation, we have a duty to always be honest and truthful with the patient, no matter what. She says in her article, the truth is the default position. And we know the truth is the default position because no one has ever said, I told you the truth because. Whenever anybody lies or deceives, they always feel a need to justify it. Right? I lied to you because. But nobody has ever said, I told you the truth because. Which means that we don't feel the need to justify it. It means that it's something that is expected. Truth is expected of us. And so Bach feels that we have an obligation, a duty, to always tell the truth to the patient no matter what. Right? Just like Kant, who had uh, wrote his work on the supposed right to lie, in which he argues that there's never any circumstance whatsoever why lying is justified, Bach feels the same way. It doesn't matter if a person is mentally incompetent. It doesn't matter if it's a small child. You tell the whole truth to the individual, no matter what. And what they choose to do with it is entirely up to them. So, since we have to justify deception, what are the reasons why people give for lying? Well, she lists three. And of those three, we are, uh, she's basically going to say that, you know, these are all ridiculous. First, is the claim that truth is impossible. Many people will make the argument that truth is impossible. And what that means is that when it comes down to it, there's so much technical jargon, there's so much background knowledge that's needed to understand anything in the field of medicine that the patient can never completely get the truth. Well, she argues that that's ridiculous. Um, maybe the patient may not get the whole truth in the sense of every Latin phrase, but you can explain things always to a patient in a way that they will be able to understand it. Um, maybe more difficult or more questions for one than it is for another, but when it comes down to it, the individual can always be told the truth. Secondly, there's the claim that patients don't want bad news. And Bach says, well, of course patients don't want bad news. Nobody does. But not wanting bad news and not being able to receive bad news, those are two very different things. The fact is, <clears throat> again, that uh, just because a person doesn't want to receive bad news doesn't mean that they're not strong enough to be able to handle it. Bach argues that most people who have been in a position in their life where they have uh, lived to an age where they have such a major problem, that person has been through enough to prove that they can handle pretty much anything that's thrown at them. And so, of course, you don't want bad news, but it doesn't mean you can't handle it. In Collins' defense, I would argue that what Bach says here is not necessarily the case, because there are people that end up in terrible situations um, which are very young, People who haven't gone through enough life to prove they can handle anything yet. You know, I mean, there, there are small children, there are babies even, who are facing life-threatening ailments. Um, you know, th those people 
not only wouldn't want bad news, but they wouldn't be in a mental state where they could probably handle it or even understand it. So, you know, I have to, have to challenge her on that one. The third point, truth can hurt the patient. That's the claim the Collins makes, right? That if I tell the whole truth to the patient, that ultimately I could be harming that patient. Well, Bach doesn't disagree with that. Bach acknowledges the fact that there are certain patients out there who have that weak mental capacity, people who would be harmed by hearing the truth. But, she says, we can't be worried about that. Our concern has to be with telling the truth because that's what's owed. What a person chooses to do with that knowledge is entirely up to them. If a person takes the truth that they are handed and they use it to throw up their arms in defeat and begin the process of dying, well, that's unfortunate. But it's out of my hands because I did what I was supposed to do. I told them the truth. If a person chooses to use that knowledge to help and benefit themselves, and that's wonderful. But again, regardless of what the patient chooses to do, it's my duty to respond. It's up to me to tell the truth as the doctor, not to choose who should receive the truth and who shouldn't, not to decide whether one person is going to tell the truth or another. But truth is what is required at all times to every patient. Bach's position is very absolutist in that respect. Okay. Um, so we have these reasons to lie, but she says all of them are just excuses. Get rid of them, throw them away, do the responsible thing, and tell the truth, and then let the chips fall where they may. Whatever the patient chooses to do with that, that is their responsibility. Um, she argues, for, as many people would, you know, hey, if, if you don't tell the whole truth to the patient, then how do you know that that in, how that individual is going to handle it? And also, it might be the case that maybe that patient has things that they want to do in their life that they haven't gotten accomplished yet, that bucket list idea. Or maybe that person hasn't made their will yet. Well, see, the problem with that and this goes back to my agreement with Collins as opposed to Bach on this issue, is very simple. First of all, in terms of the question of making a will, if you have enough that it becomes worthwhile to make a will, you need to go ahead and do it. Don't wait until somebody tells you you're going to die before you make one. Because if you do, it's going to be very easy for that will to be challenged. People will claim that because of the information that you've received, you were not in your right state of mind when you made that. And it can easily be challenged, it can easily be thrown into probate, all kinds of problems can, can occur. It's happened before. And more to the point, I think that one of the things that we should be looking at is the idea of quality of life versus quantity. The quality of life is what has to be important. And she says, you know, hey, what if, what if there's things that you want to do? Uh, maybe, maybe you've always wanted to, to go to Australia and you've never done it yet. Maybe you've always wanted to go on an African safari and you haven't done it yet. Well, again, if you want to do those things, don't wait till somebody puts a death sentence over your head before you do them. That's not going to do any good for you. Because even though you may go and do those things, you're not going to enjoy them. You're not going to derive the enjoyment and relish that you would get out of those things ordinarily under those circumstances. The simple fact is that as soon as someone passes that death sentence and says you have six months to live or a year to live, that's the only thing that you're ever going to think about for the rest of your life. And that's why I feel that revealing that particular piece of information is the cruelest thing that any doctor could ever do. There will not be quality of life once that information is given to you. 
because everything you do is going to be colored by the idea that I'm not going to be here next year. And every thought that you have is going to be focused upon your death. And that's no way for a person to live their life. You know, as human beings, we know somewhere in the back of our mind that we're mortal. We know somewhere in the back of our mind that, that we're going to die someday. But we survive mostly by putting that to the very back of our mind and not thinking about it. It could happen today, it could happen 70 years in the future. But it's going to happen at some point, but we don't think about it. But the second that doctor passes that death sentence and says you've got a year left to live, it's right there brought to the forefront of your mind. And as a human being, at that point, you are forced to confront something that human beings were never meant to confront. You're forced to confront something that we were never meant to know. No one is supposed to know when they're going to die. And so by giving that knowledge to the patient, that is actually perpetuating the greatest cruelty that you possibly can have. I think that in general telling the truth to the patient is a good thing. But I think that when it comes to that question of putting a time stamp on the person's life, then I have to agree 120% with Collins that it should not be done. That that person should not have to endure that. Give them, leave them that sense of hope so that they can enjoy what time they have left and have some kind of quality of life uh, left to them. You know? If you want to do something in your life, do it. If you need to make a will, do it. Don't wait till somebody gives you a death sentence before you do it. Of course, as always, you guys have the opportunity to uh, decide for yourself whether you agree with Bach or with uh, Collins on this one. But as I said, for me, uh, it's, it's Collins all the way. We'll, of course, get to talk about this issue of paternalistic uh, deception when we get into the case discussion, specifically with the one that begins on page 167 with the potent placebo. Um, essentially, we have to decide whether or not a placebo is a lie or a deception, or whether it's just another tool in the doctor's toolkit that they can use to help benefit their patient. If it is a deception, we have to decide whether it's a warranted or justified deception or not. So that's usually a pretty interesting uh, discussion, so hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, but for right now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, allow this video to elapse, and we'll move on to the last one, which will deal with the question of non-paternalistic deception. <laughs>